Great. Okay. Um, and because this is a recording and folks will be able to watch um, at any time, we'll probably just get started here to have the full hour. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, this is a panel discussion on the intersection between financial status and domestic violence hosted by the COVID-19 Task Force on Domestic Violence. This is the 13th in our seminar series focused on educating and discussing domestic violence during this time, this time being the, the COVID-19 pandemic. We're so thankful to have you all tuned in and it'd be great to get a sense of who is in our audience right now. So if you could introduce yourself in the chat box with your name, your pronouns and where you are calling in from tonight, that would be great. I can do this verbally. Uh, my name is Chiara Albanese and I take the pronouns she, her, hers. I graduated from Harvard College last year um, with a degree in psychology and women and gender studies. And I'm calling in from my childhood bedroom in Massachusetts, although I now live um, in Washington, DC and I'm just home for the holidays. Um, my name is Tracy Socket, and I use the She, Her series. I just dropped up working as a field organizer for the Biden campaign, and I'll be continuing my studies at Columbia and their political science department in the new year. I am calling in from New York City. I'm still grateful every time Tracy says that for all of her hard work, so thank you, Tracy. Um, and Tracy and I are part of the COVID-19 Task Force on Domestic Violence. Our goals as a task force are threefold investigation of data on domestic violence, education of the public on the issue and how to get involved and advocacy on behalf of survivors. I, along with everyone on, am so glad you're here with us today. And if you wanna learn more about our organization, please check out the chat for more information where I see Tracy just posted more. Yeah. Um, we are honored to be moderating this discussion with our two incredible panelists who will be providing their expertise, insight, and reflections. We'll just quickly introduce our panelists and then we'll dive into our discussion. So today we are joined by Dr. Claire M. Renzetti, Professor and Chair of Sociology and the Judy Conway Patton Endowed Chair for Studies of Violence Against Women at the University of Kentucky. For more than 35 years, Dr. Renzetti's research has focused on the violent victimization experiences of socially and economically marginalized women and girls. She has written or edited 26 books, as well as numerous book chapters and journal articles based on her own research. She has held elected offices in several national and regional professional associations, including the American Soci Sorry. Sociological Association, the American Society of Criminology, the Society for the Study of Social Problems, and the Eastern Sociological Society. Her research and community service has been recognized with awards from the American Sociological Association, the American Society of Criminolo Criminology, the Society for the Study of Social Problems, the University of Delaware, Artemis Center in Dayton, Ohio, Ohio and the YWCA of Dayton, Ohio. Believe it or not, these bios are actually trimmed down. So we're with some serious experts <laughs> this <laughs> evening. <laughs> Um, and, expertise. <laughs> and then to introduce our other panelists, Dr. Cynthia Sanders. Dr. Cynthia Sanders is a professor at Boise State University School of Social Work and a faculty associate with the Center for Social Development at Washington University in St. Louis. Her research interests focus on women and children living in poverty and community-based initiatives to promote financial inclusion and capability. Much of her recent research examines the role of financial factors in intimate partner violence, and initiatives to promote financial capability among survivors, including financial education, individual development accounts, economic advocacy, and empowerment. Additionally, she is currently examining city and state-based policy initiatives that promote financial, social, and political inclusion of marginalized groups. So those in very few words for all they know are two panelists and we were meant to also be joined by a third guest who has unfortunately pulled away last minute, um, but are very happy to have Dr. Anzetti and Dr. Sanders. So thank you guys so much for your time. And um, now we can finally start the discussion. Tracy, take it away. So starting very broadly, how would you explain how domestic violence intersects with financial status? Cynthia, you wanna go first? Sure, I can go first. Um, so I think I think that one thing to think about is um, that there are sort of two pieces to this, both um, issues of financial abuse 
and financial and issues related to financial status. Um, so along with other forms of violence, such as physical and psychological or emotional um, abuse, um, financial abuse is also a, a key dimension that we should be acknowledging and addressing uh, in our work around domestic violence. Um, and so in terms of the intersection between domestic violence and both financial abuse and financial status, I think the first thing to recognize is that um, although domestic violence cuts across all socioeconomic classes, um, that poor women in particular are especially vulnerable um, to domestic violence in general, research shows that, and that, that poverty is sort of a primary um, driver in um, continuing to be able to continue um, abuse, the continuation of domestic violence within a household. So studies do show that when survivors have access to more financial resources, that they're in a better position to be able to, to make a choice to leave um, and then not have to return. Um, this is especially true if there are children involved as well. Um, and then secondly, um, women are often, or survivors, gender-based violence, um, are often prevented from leaving. I, I keep using the term women just because most of my work has been with women, but of course we know this can apply across the gender spectrum. Um, so sort of the second thing to think about is um, that women are often economically dependent on an abusive partner. Um, so they're unable to leave because they're economically dependent. And if they do leave, they're oftentimes forced to go back because there are not sufficient economic resources available to help them long term. Um, and I'm Claire, Claire, I'm sure you can expand on all of these. But then the third one would, that I think about is um, that frequently women's employment is jeopardized because of domestic violence, either they're not able to work or when they are working that an abuser may sabotage them or show up at their workplace. And then, the, so that really has to do with sort of the more of the intersection between domestic violence and financial status. Um, and then there's also this issue of financial abuse where there are very intentional tactics that are used by an abusive partner um, that can range from things like complete control over household finances to um, a survivor not having any access to financial knowledge, uh, their name not being on bank accounts or assets, or their name being only on um, credit cards um, and an abuser then racking up debt, destroying their credit, um, or vice versa, um, not having any their name on any credit building um, assets, so they're not able to build any credit. Um, so those are some examples. Um, and I'll let Claire kind of expand on some of those in additional content as well. Well, one of the things that I would emphasize is, is that you made the point that um, intimate partner violence cuts across all social classes, but uh, women who are poor and poor households are at greater, greater risk. Um, but I also want to emphasize that there's even more intersectionality going on there so that um, we can look at social class as one factor, but we also know that, that among poor women, um, there are other uh, social identity, social lo locating factors that affect one's likelihood of being both poor and experiencing abuse. And so we need to look at race and ethnicity as well. And women with disabilities we know also have an increased risk for both unemployment um, or uh, underemployment as well as um, intimate partner violence. So we need to you know, uh, account for those um, intersecting inequalities, I guess, as we, we consider these, these issues as well. Um, and, and I think Cynthia made the really important point that um, employment can, uh, you know, earning wages 
can um, improve battered women's ability to leave. Some, some, there is some research that indicates that, um, that in some relationships, uh, particular relationships in which women are working and the male intimate partner is unemployed, that that can actually precipitate uh, or increase the risk of intimate partner violence, um, depending on the gender norms um, that dominate that relationship. So some men may find it very, very threatening um, that their female partners are employed and they aren't, or that their partners are earning more money than they are, or that their partners are more independent of them than they would like, and that could um, precipitate the violence. I, I think if we're considering this in the context of COVID though, we have a whole new set of issues um, that need to be considered in terms of the types of jobs that people are working in or are losing. Um, and the fact that some people are now having to work at home in very small spaces with intimate partners who may be violent, who may have been violent or abusive pre-COVID, but now are at home with, with their partners all the time and there are children at home too, with people having to share space as well as resources for getting work done and getting schoolwork done and you know all the rest of it. And we know that women's social support networks are really important in terms of um, helping, particularly in terms of providing real financial resources and assistance when there's abuse and, and helping them get out. And now those support networks are really constrained due to the virus. And so it increases the isolation that um, abused women are dealing with. Yeah, Claire, I wanted to just build on a comment you made um, with regard to um, that when um, women do have economic resources or they advance their economic well-being, uh, that that can um, sometimes be threatening and initiate more violence. But the flip side of that is also true. There's research that shows the opposite of that. So it just goes to show that every, that, you know, domestic violence is very complicated and, and there are different kind of scenarios going on. So the opposite can actually be true too, where if a um, survivor has um, more economic resources or is the primary breadwinner in the household, that sometimes I can act as a protective factor because then the abusive partner has more to lose. Um, and so, you know, with the um, larger uh, rate of unemployment now that's happening with COVID, that potentially, you know, presents more risks in some scenarios where maybe the the additional economic resources or income coming in can also be a protective factor. So um, again, I think, you know, it's important to consider that it, it's, can, it can do both and it's very unique to that particular relationship. Yeah, that's a really important point, Cynthia. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And I think right now, um, you know, we're seeing reports about women um, who are employed, you know, they are really doing a double or triple shift in that they're having to get, you know, do work, their, their employment, but they are also primarily responsible for childcare and their children's schooling and all the rest of it. Um, and this presents tremendous strains for them, but at the same time that it, and, and then also isolating them. I mean, what support they may get from their social networks or what support they may get from an employer becomes uh, more difficult and more tenuous during this time. Um, but I, I think your point that these relationships are extremely complex is an important one. I think lots of times we're looking for the answer or the causal variable, you know, and, and the relationships are very, very complex and may work differently for different types of intimate relationships. Yeah, I, I, sort of another issue related to that um, in one of the studies I, I did, um, looking at um, sort of the role of finances in the household and how that related to domestic violence, 
was that financial matters themselves and issues around financial stress can also be an impetus to other forms of violence. So mon money issues or you know, controlling money um, and stress around money may be an impetus to other emotional, psychological, physical types of abuse. And um, in the study I did, it, it, I also talked with women where money was used you know, uh, to be sexually exploitive, withholding money for sex within relationships. So with COVID, I think all of those things are escalated because of fight the additional financial stress that households are going through. Excellent. Thank you. That was an incredibly comprehensive answer to that um, very short question. So thank you. That's fascinating. Um, Speaking specifically about your expertise, which is, is grounded in financial status, status or socioeconomic status and how that intersects with these issues. Um, what do you feel is a unique challenge about financial abuse compared to other, other sorts of intimate partner violence when looking to, to help survivors or when looking to advocate on behalf of them? Like what, what makes financial abuse unique or especially difficult? Well, I, I think one thing is um, that until really in the last maybe 10 to 15 years, financial abuse was really not even recognized as a dimension of domestic violence. Um, and so I think there's been more work done within about the last 15 years, but even more so within the, I mean, I see a lot more literature on this now in the last you know, half a dozen years. Um, so I think one of the challenges is for both survivors to recognize that that is a form of abuse and for service providers and advocates um, and policymakers um, to recognize that financial abuse is a, a, like a key dimension of the dynamics of intimate partner violence um, and a huge barrier for survivors to be able to disconnect from that situation. Um, so I think that's one of the barriers um, or one of the unique things. Um, and then I think it's just, you know, it's a, sort of a unique dimension in terms of um, what advocates and so, social service providers and community um, based programs um, do with do with it. How do they address it? Uh, and I think there are a lot of different ways you, you, you can address it, which I assume we'll, we'll get to those questions. I won't launch into that now, but I think that's one of the really unique things about it is in some ways it's very new in terms of recognizing it and then, and then how do we address it. And I think too that we have to think about, you know, we tend to see uh, these issues as sort of discrete problems, you know, as opposed to within the relationship at, uh, an interconnection among these various problems. I mean, one of the things you said, Cynthia, was to have to get uh, survivors themselves to recognize that these behaviors are abusive because we tend to think of abuse as a physical mm -hmm. act. A lot of people will say, oh, I'm not, I'm not abused or I'm not a bad woman because he's never hit me or he doesn't do physical things to me but he does a lot, there's a lot of course of control going on there and economic abuse is at the heart of course of control. So I, I think that's really important. And then at the same time, having um, service providers of all types recognize the interconnections of these various problems and, and also to realize that, that they can't see their own services as sort of discrete entities vying for a budget or vying for funding from a, a single pie, you know, a finite pie that if I get funding for my agency, then that's going to be less for you. And, and I provide this, I provide housing assistance that doesn't have anything to do with domestic violence, that's for the domestic violence service providers. And in fact, that's not the case. I mean, 
when we're talking about financial abuse, we very much have to talk about housing um, mm -hmm. and affordable housing and access to affordable housing and that sort of thing. And so um, we need to think about how all of these problems are not discrete. They're all um, interrelated and therefore agencies addressing them have to see them as interrelated um, and discuss them that way and, and develop mutual, um, I guess, agreements with one another in terms of referrals and services and, and so on. Great, thanks for sharing. Um, so our next question is, um, how has your work been impacted due to the pandemic? Go ahead, Claire. Well, uh, one major federally funded study that we're in the middle of at a, at a um, shelter for women leaving abuse has basically had to be put on hold um, because essentially we can't go there. It's, it's um, too dangerous for everyone involved, for the women in the shelter and, and uh, and for the researchers. Um, so we basically had to stop data collection. This is a study that um, has relevance to the issue of, of economic abuse and, and financial stability in that we're looking at, a, um, we've come to lovingly call the farm project that is part of the shelter services. Women can uh, volunteer to work on a farm. Um, the, the shelter is located on about, I think it's 60 acres of farmland. Um, and they decided to uh, grow produce and flowers. They now make soaps and body products in a special kitchen for this. And it's really, really grown. But the women learn all kinds of skills, you know, marketing and sales and, um, you know, and other, other skills. And we're looking at, uh, we're comparing the women who work on the farm uh, with women who choose not to and just receive standard services of the shelter. Um, and so that requires us to go to the shelter and go out into the farm and you know, be with the women in the farm and also interview them and have them complete surveys. And so we basically had to put it all on hold until we, it's safe for everyone to go back and, and do this work. I mean, some of the women in the shelter actually had to be moved to motels because the shelter was too full of people and it was too dangerous in terms of social distance. They couldn't socially distance. And you have lots of kids who were going out to school and coming back and you know, it was just really, really hard. So apart from the research itself, you know, these women and their children are dealing with COVID too. And so their safety and their health is really primary. Um, so we've, we've essentially put it on hold until we can go back and everyone is safe um, to allow us to do that. Yeah, I've had similar experience just in the sense of that um, research kind of is not the priority right now, even though, you know, it's important to, to do research and find out what's going on specifically during COVID. Um, but I've, I've had li more limited contact with community partners and providers. Um, and, and then just in terms of my personal uh, work around teaching, teaching has, is a lot more work during COVID. And so I simply don't have as much time to devote to, to my scholarship and work in the community. Um, but I, I do know that, you know, some of the community providers are, um, I mean, they're, they're working really hard um, to get, get the word out that their doors are still open, that, you know, they're finding ways to provide services. Um, like Claire mentioned that, you know, the number of, of people they can bring into crisis housing is limited because of COVID. Um, but they, they're partnering with hotels and that kind of thing. But even hotels are limited on the number of people that they can bring in because of COVID. So it's definitely presented some real challenges. Additionally, um, you know, funding in general for social services and um, community agencies are, are unfortunately being restricted quite a bit. Um, 
And so what agencies and providers are able to do in terms of their programming and outreach is more limited. And then of course they're having to be much more creative in how they're doing outreach because of um, survivors being more isolated and maybe not having access to information, maybe not being able to get on the internet, um, maybe not being able to make phone calls when they're, while they're in the same household with an abuser. Um, and of course that kind of thing can happen all the time, but it's, um, it's you know, significantly worse now that people are sort of on these home, stay at home mandates. Got it. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Those budgetary issues that you mentioned, Cynthia, for the agencies themselves, are really, really critical right now. And, and you know, there's just such a concern that as state and local governments' budgets are strained as a result of COVID, that this is going to have a tremendous impact on these services, all services. But, you know, uh, given what the services we work with, um, we're especially concerned about them. It's, it's really worrisome. Um, and, you know, we just don't know what's gonna happen because there hasn't been a second relief package approved. And that's gonna make a huge difference for state and local governments and what they can provide. Um, again, for all sorts of relief, you know, unemployment and rent forgiveness and you know, all kinds of stuff that I wanna emphasize once again, are all related to domestic violence. So any, any of those types of services that get cut can potentially impact um, women living in, in violent relationships. I mean, and, I, and this isn't specific to financial, the financial intersection, but I also think it's important to just recognize that during COVID, um, you know, one of the main ways that um, domestic violence is um, recognized is through the medical system. And so because of COVID, a lot of people are actually seeking um, medical care. So again, just sort of increasing the isolation. Well, yeah, I mean, some people are worried about going to an emergency room mm -hmm. because they're afraid of getting COVID. So they won't, they won't go for other reasons um, because they're worried about that. And yet that's a wonderful opportunity to screen um, for domestic violence. Yeah, that's, those are a lot of excellent points that I had not thought of. Thank you for bringing light to those. Um, so as we discussed before everyone else joined us on this call, we do have a vaccine on the way, but the pandemic is, is far from over. Um, and it seems like we'll be seeing lots of effects of it for, for years to come. I'm curious if you two have given any thought to it yet, what sort of long-term impacts we'll see um, in the domestic violence space, even after this more acute phase of the pandemic is over. You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, and of course, it's all speculation mm -hmm. at this point, and everybody is so preoccupied with just making sure that people stay healthy and safe. Um, but I, I do think that one of the things that has happened is that we've had to be more creative and um, agencies have, have, have had to come up, advocates and agencies have had to come up with um, really innovative ways to um, address the needs of their clients. And, and I think that that is something that won't go away. I mean, I think people have had to um, really think hard about how they can meet the needs of the people who come to them for help. And that's produced some really innovative responses. And so I, I think that we'll probably see that continue, you know, the use of technology and, and um, things like that. Um, so I think that that will make a big difference. But again, I, I really worry about the budget issues and how, how deep the economic impact is going to be in terms of, of funding all sorts of social services. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um... Claire, and I think, um, 
I think the both the heck the health and the economic impacts are going to far outlive COVID. Um, so you know, if we think about it in terms of financial um, status or financial abuse, and that that's going to be you know going on, um, and the additional stress that that's happening around finances during COVID. Um, you're likely to see um, longer term effects of things like um, more debt, um, you know, which may be the burden of the woman or the survivor, or um, I think we're going to see longer term effects of this intersection that Claire mentioned earlier with regard to disability and domestic violence because of the health, the long term health impacts of COVID. Um, and so there's going to be, um, it could have a major impact on social, um, the social safety net with regard to this intersection of, of disability and domestic violence as well. Um, and then with, you know, the long-term funding issues, I think will be uh, really a challenge because I think, um, Potentially, when you know COVID isn't as um, prominent as it, it is right now, that some social service organizations are going to be sort of left to to figure it out financially. That it's there's not necessarily going to be the kind of policy and funding planning that needs to happen to support programming long term to address the economic impacts. Great. So our next question is um, a threefold. So kind of um, address this as, as you wish. Um, how would how do you see the future of domestic violence advocacy looking? How would you like it to look? And how does financial abuse play into this? You want me to go first, Claire? OK. Um, well, I liked, because I'm a social worker, um, and we, we tend to think about things on micro, meso, and macro levels. Um, I tend to sort of approach thinking about um, working in, in domestic violence and advocacy work at all three of those levels. Um, so I think the first thing sort of relates back to the importance of recognizing financial abuse and financial status as a component of domestic violence. And so at a more of a micro level, um, service providers, advocates, um, counselors need to be doing um, financial abuse assessments. So when they're doing assessments around physical or psychological or emotional or sexual abuse, there also needs to be a component around um, financial abuse. And there are some measurement tools that have come out on that in, in the last decade. Um, but the extent to which um, service providers are using them or not, we don't really know. So I would say um, that that's one component. Um, I think at the meso level um, that we, we'd like to, I'd like to see more community-based organizations doing the, the work around addressing financial abuse and financial status as a key component to help women long-term. Um, and this obviously relates back to sort of my specific work that I've done around the intersection between domestic violence and financial capability programs, um, things like financial education or literacy programs um, that help build both not just knowledge, but also um, financial capability. So people learn about finances, they learn about budgeting, they learn about their credit, they learn about um, savings accounts, uh, but then they have an opportunity to actually act on that knowledge to build financial capability. Um, so through the use of things like um, match savings programs, individual development accounts, um, and there are some community-based programs specific, specifically designed. Um, I've been fortunate to be involved in some of those um, that have developed financial literacy specific with, with the specific needs of survivors in mind. So 
um, kind of going back to this issue that when, when women or survivors maybe advance themselves financially, uh, that, that could be threatening. So there are lots of financial literacy and education and IDA programs and micro enterprise programs and all the kinds of financial capability building programs we can think about out there, but they don't necessarily develop them with the specific needs of survivors in mind. And when I say that, I specifically am talking about the need for safety components, right? So how do you, how do you safely uh, open an IDA account? Um, uh, which then those savings can be used for things like education or home ownership or micro enterprise. Um, or how do you safely um, make sure you have all the important documents you need if, when you're able to leave? Or um, how do you safely uh, check your credit report and make efforts to change, improve your credit report without that flagging your abusive partner, particularly if you're you know, married. Um, so those kinds of programs, we need more of those community-based programs that are thinking about um, more longer-term kind of social development and financial capability building with survivors. Um, you know, I think service providers have had and continue to have their hands full on a sort of short-term basis of meaning short-term housing and short-term um, economic basic needs, um, which are vital and critical that they continue to do that. But then also thinking about um, some of these little bit longer programs that help develop um, financial capability. Um, and then there's macro larger sort of state and federal policies um, that we can talk about, but I'll stop there and let Claire chime in. <laughs> is she there or is she frozen? Uh-oh. Hi, Claire, looks like you're back. If you wanted to chime in on that question. Hopefully you heard what I said, Claire. I heard most of what you said. Yeah, I was only gone very briefly. I heard most okay, of what you said. And I stopped at the mesa level. So I didn't really talk too much about more macro state or federal policies that, that could help as well. I, I, I totally agree with what you said, Cynthia. I, I think uh, one of the, the things that we need to, to address is the fact that, um, again, many agencies, many different types of agencies should be screening for all types of domestic violence. Um, what I found in, in my work with women who live in public housing developments was that many of them did not seek assistance from a domestic violence service provider. That what they told me was, look, I can deal. I can deal with him. I can deal with with what he's doing, but I need help with housing. I need help with the job. I, I'm, you know, I need help. Lots of different forms of financial help. And in fact, what was happening was that the the person who was being abusive would take all of her money, and so she wasn't looking at at that as abuse and either were the service providers she was trying to get help from for housing and and other services and so i think we need that kind of screening for all forms of domestic violence not just by domestic violence service providers mm -hmm. again people need to to see that these problems are interrelated and that someone seeking housing assistance may need to may need a different type of housing than what you might be suggesting because where you're suggesting isn't safe for them because they're a survivor. You know, so I really, I really support the idea of advocacy in the, in the future, but right now really looking at um, advocacy from a, a bunch of different angles and services from a lot of different perspectives and having them work together to realize that this is a problem that they may see in their agency, even if they're not a domestic violence service agency. You know, I think that's really, really critical. And the, the financial literacy programming for women is, is so important. And, and I have found that some women don't realize they need it until it's 
very, very problematic. Um, I recently worked with a woman who was actually, um, well, she didn't think she was poor. I mean, she was living quite well with, with her partner, with her husband. Um, but she, they had a very, very uh, con controlling, he, he was very controlling. And she thought she was living quite well and then he died and she found out that they had no savings that she thought they had. He had left no pension. I mean, the only thing she had was social security and all this stuff that she had bought. And she didn't even know to open the mail. She said she had a big pile of unopened mail. And, and I said, you know, should we open the mail and go through the mail? And she said, oh, I, I never opened the mail. That wasn't anything I dealt with. She said, I, I only went and got this mail. Uh, they lived in a building in a condominium. I only went to get this mail because they told me the mailbox was full, but I never ever picked up the mail. So she didn't even know what bills there were, you mm -hmm. know, and that that's pretty fundamental. So here she was all of a sudden she found herself quite financially constrained and didn't have a clue what to do about this. So I think that we need to have these financial literacy programs um, very broadly offered and very, very broadly available in a number of different ways, perhaps via the internet for some people who can't admit that, that this is an issue in public, but they could go online and do a program. Um, because it's really very difficult and has very serious consequences. So I think that's critically important. Yeah, and I think um, I think for some women, um, at least in some of the programming I've been involved with, some of the women are feel very overwhelmed and hopeless about their financial futures because of the financial abuse, because their abuser has racked up um, debt in their name and ruined their credit record or because you know, they're struggling with um, a limited income or living in poverty and, and they feel like um, they feel hopeless and that there's not a positive path forward. And so I think that's when it's important to also include in the um, financial capability programming, one-on-one um, -on -one advocacy with um, you know, a financial advocate or financial coach, sometimes they call them, so that um, women have someone to work with one-on-one -on -one in a safe environment um, that understand what they're going through and understand the limitations to the kinds of choices that they can make and limitations to the kind of goals they can make. Um, and that for some women, you know, the, the a short-term goal may be, may be something like just looking at their credit report safely. Um, and a longer term goal might be something like, you know, being able to save in an IDA program or open a, a bank account. Um, and that that's the, the types of goals and what women or survivors are able to do is really gonna vary based on sort of their lethality of the situation that they might be in. But that even small steps and setting small goals uh, around financial aspects can be very empowering. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, I don't think Claire nor I mentioned, but obviously one of those, the dimensions that is really important beyond sort of this individual assessment and um, community-based programming are larger, you know, state and federal policies that are more adequately funding um, domestic violence service provision, specifically around the issue of finances and economic well being. So, you know, for example, the Violence Against Women Act um, historically is focused more on things like criminal justice aspects, counseling, crisis services, um, and you know, more recently has added some provisions around housing um, and protection of housing. But um, I think some of these larger federal policies, um, Violence Against Women Act, VOCA, 
so some of these uh, large funding entities, um, that there could be more provisions in those that are addressing specifically the economic dimensions of domestic violence and longer term economic support programs, programming? I, I think too, in terms of state and federal policy, I think one of the things that really has to happen is that we need to um, make, lift some of the restrictions on public assistance programs that have been imposed over the years, making it more and more difficult for people to get public financial assistance and of all sorts. Uh, for adults as well as for children. And, and I really think all of those um, programs need a very careful look and, and restructuring or, um, or uh, replacement with programs that actually provide help for the largest number of people who need it. Um, because right now it's sort of, you have to prove in six different ways that you are eligible and worthy of assistance. Um, and over the, over the last, what, two decades or more, three decades really, um, there have been more and more restrictions placed on eligibility for financial assistance, public financial assistance um, that have made it, that have reduced the so-called welfare roles but have not reduced the problem of poverty by any means, no, or, no. or uh, you know, have, are not assisting people. The number of people. Claire's frozen. Um, so I'll jump in on, on what she was saying. Um, I mean, the other thing about. Um, Programs like TANA, food, food stamps, Medi Medicaid, um, public assistance programs. Um, not only has it become more difficult to qualify, but those are those tend to be fairly short-term support programs. Um, and so, as women may improve their economic status, then they're likely to lose, you know, public assistance support. Um, so in some ways there's, you know, it, it doesn't provide um, the right kind of incentive for long-term economic well-being. Um, and then, you know, there are, there are still several states that don't even have the family violence option as part of their um, temporary assistance for needy families cash assistance programs, which is, you know, in, in most states, there is some form of a family violence option where the lifetime limit, which you know, federal limit is five years. Many states have shorter terms. Idaho, for example, has a two year lifetime limit. Um, family violence option can provide waivers to that limit. Um, and there are some states that, including Idaho, that do not have a family violence option provision. Um, so. And know. at the same time, the people who um, are in the the agencies where women are going to apply for assistance need to let those women know about the family violence option um, mm -hmm. and alternatives that are available to them. And that doesn't always happen either. So that's, that's a, a missed opportunity for assistance. Sure. Um, also, I just want to mention that Kiara's internet cut out and um, yeah, she's trying to rejoin, but um, we might not get her back. She wanted to apologize um, for that, but we all know. Mine, mine's going in and out, so you might lose me again. <laughs> no worries. Well, I'll just move on to um, the final question that we have prepared, and then we'll go on to the audience questions. Um, specifically concerning financial abuse, what recommendations do you have for allies or community members on how to support domestic violence survivors in both the short and long term? Well, as I mentioned before, um, women's social support networks are extremely important. And you have to do more than just listen to a story and provide emotional support. I mean, what women really often need are um, places to go and stay um, where they're safe and they need financial assistance. And so 
I think we need to listen to the survivors themselves and what the research indicates that they say they need that's most helpful to them is, uh, you know, housing assistance, financial assistance, those kinds of concrete resources um, that can help them get not only leave the situation, but once they leave, truly survive it, you know, not just leave and be homeless. Um, yeah. That's back. not an alternative. Yeah, not have to go back, right? Because they they don't have affordable housing. And like Claire just kind of inferred, um, one of the largest reasons that women women and children are homeless is because of domestic violence, and the, the you know that housing is unaffordable, um, and that there's not enough long longer term financial support for um, survivors to sort of be able to break that cycle. Um, and be able to take care of themselves and their children in a longer term way. They're oftentimes, you know, sort of pushed back to this economic dependence position on an abusive, on an abusive partner. So, um, yeah, I agree with that. You know, one, one thing that we haven't mentioned that I think is also really important is childcare. I mean, mm -hmm. we said now during COVID, children are at home and you know, women are doing multiple shifts in terms of childcare. They always do, right? Even pre-COVID, you know, they had primary responsibility for childcare. And one of the, the things that I often hear from women who are uh, financially constrained, who are poor and who are trying to work um, at sometimes more than one job um, to make ends meet is, you know, I. I can't not see him because he's my, he's who I rely on for childcare or my ex mother-in-law, you know, uh, or my current mother-in-law, whatever is, is the person who takes care of my kids when I go to work and, and therefore I can't avoid him. We have a real childcare crisis in this country. And this, this goes back to, you know, Cynthia's point about macro level you know, state and federal government concerns. We have a huge childcare crisis in this country that COVID has illuminated even more, but we've had it forever. And we don't put um, public assistance or public childcare as a top priority in this country. And we really need to, and this is something many women who are trying to leave abusive relationships very much need um, is safe, affordable, reliable childcare. Um, that would be a huge step forward. Yeah, and then I guess I would just add, um, sort of circling back to the beginning um, around the intersectionality of all of this that, um, you know, again, that this does disproportionately affect uh, low-income women, um, women of color, immigrant women, women uh, with disabilities or survivors with disabilities. Um, and so a lot of these community-based programs also need to sort of keep that in mind in terms of sort of the cultural relevance of, of programming as well. Right, so um, moving on to some of the um, questions that we have from audience members before we run out of time. Um, I know we already kind of addressed the um, issue of financial abuse and domestic violence um, throughout the pandemic, unless there was anything else that the two of you wanted to add to that. Um, and then also somebody was wondering um, regarding the farm shelter program that was mentioned, um, how can allies financially support this effort? Are there um, things that are available for purchase? Yes, um, I will put on my advertising hat for a minute. <laughs> so the um, shelter is called Greenhouse 17. Um, it's uh, the website is greenhouse17.org. And, um, <laughs> and you can go to the website and you can purchase, you can make a donation uh, online or you can purchase the products that the women have made the soaps and Shoot, an evening of Zoom Girl. issues. <laughs> Contagious. Um, just in time for my question, though. Sorry about that, everyone. My Wi-Fi was done with me this evening. Um, but it seems like Claire did say we can purchase them. 
Yeah, she gave the website and it sounds like there's things that can be purchased. Oh, excellent. I was wondering for my for my Christmas gifts. It's a great idea. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know if we're gonna get Claire back in a second or not. Maybe not. But Tracy, I imagine you got through most of the questions in my absence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got through the last one and um, just touched on those audience questions. Um, unless there's anything else that um, any of our audience members want to throw in the chat or um, Cynthia, if you have anything that you want to add, um, if we get Claire back, maybe she wants to add something. Um, gosh, I think we've, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, this has been a great opportunity to highlight um, a really important dimension of domestic violence that is, is gaining um, more ground and more um, support and and more recognition, but still uh, compared to you know other dimensions of domestic violence is sort of under understudied and under um, examined and addressed. Um, obviously it makes some sense in the sense that, you know, a woman's physical safety is always, always takes first priority. But um, in order to maintain that physical safety, we really do need to address this issue of um, the financial aspects of women's lives, both the, the uh, <laughs> both the financial abuse and just their financial status and capacity to, you know, be have financial self-efficacy and, and independence and support themselves and their children without being forced into um, staying with an abusive partner. I just put the um, name of the organization in the chat, um, greenhouse17.org. And if you go to their website, you can learn more about the farm program itself, as well as find um, the products that they have available for sale. Thank you so much. You you missed it, but I was very curious about this question as I start to do my holiday shopping. So thank you so much. That's a great way to to give back and also get some nice things. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, um, Cynthia was just giving kind of a closing thought. So if you wanted to add anything um, before we sign off for the night, I would just say thank you to both of you for doing this um, and for those who joined in. Um, and also to Cynthia for participating. It's just any time that we can do anything to bring attention to this issue, um, it, it's gonna be around long after COVID ends and, and it was around long before COVID. So it's really critical that you did this and I, I truly appreciate it. So I thank you very much for that. Yeah, and I'd just like to echo that too. I think I just really appreciate that you are doing this, that you're, um, you know, looking at all aspects of domestic violence during COVID and that you uh, are highlighting this dimension as well. And I just, I really appreciate being able to participate um, well, along with Claire. Claire. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you both so much for your time and for sharing your expertise. And um, thank you to our audience members um, for joining us and for bearing through all of the technological difficulties. <laughs> it's just the time we live in. <laughs> but thank you guys so much. Yes, thank you. Thank Have you. a good night, everyone. Too. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.